Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is using an oscilloscope to measure and display AC power. Our objective is to learn how to use the math functions on a modern oscilloscope to measure and display a plot of power as a function of time on an oscilloscope. This short lecture operates under the presumption the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with basic oscilloscope measurement techniques, can use a sensing resistor to indirectly measure current in an AC circuit, and has an understanding of AC power calculations. You'll recall that a small sensing resistor in series with an impedance can be used to indirectly measure current through a circuit, allowing the user the ability to measure not only current magnitude, but also determine the relative phase shift of current with respect to voltage. Given an oscilloscope can simultaneously display these two properties, voltage and current, it is the simple matter of multiplying instantaneous voltage and instantaneous current to obtain instantaneous power. Luckily, modern oscilloscopes with a set of basic math functions allow this ability at the touch of a button. For the purposes of today's lecture, we'll be making use of the Tektronix TBS-1032B digital oscilloscope. This in no way is meant to be neither an exhaustive review of this tool, nor an endorsement of this particular manufacturer or model. I only wish to present the functions of interest on a representative example so the viewer can gain some practical exposure to these functions and interpret the manner in which the results are displayed. As a preparatory exercise of viewer, let's put our circuit analysis and power calculation skills to the test. Consider the following series AC circuit consisting of a 6.3 volt sinusoidal AC source with an excitation frequency of 70 Hz, a 10 microfarad capacitor, and a 270 ohm resistor. So we have a basis of comparison for the practical portion of this lecture. See if you could solve for the voltage drop across each element, the current through each element, the apparent, real, and reactive power delivered to each element, the source current, and the total apparent, real, and reactive power delivered to the complete circuit. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should obtain the following results. The complex impedance of the 10 microfarad capacitor is 227.4 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Let's call this impedance Z1. The complex impedance of the 270 ohm resistor is 270 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees. Let's call this impedance Z2. There are several ways to obtain the desired figures. Perhaps the easiest and most direct means of doing so is through the use of the AC voltage divider rule. The AC voltage divider rule suggests that V1 equals 4.1 volts at an angle of negative 49.9 degrees. We could use another implementation of the AC voltage divider rule applied to the remaining element. However, let's make use of Kirchhoff's voltage law. We know the source voltage and we know the voltage drop across the first element. A rearrangement of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation solving for unknown voltage V2 suggests that V2 equals source voltage minus V1. Substituting in our given values yields V2 to be the remaining 4.8 volts at an angle of 40.1 degrees. Application of AC Ohm's law to Z1 illustrates that the current through the capacitor is 17.8 mA at an angle of 40.1 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current through the capacitor leads voltage across it by a relative 90 degrees. We should therefore expect all apparent power delivered to the capacitor to be directed towards a reactive interchange. Given this is a series circuit with a single path for current, we can also say I2 and source current also equals 17.8 mA at an angle of 40.1 degrees. A phasor diagram for Z2 illustrates current through the resistor is in phase with the voltage across it. We should therefore expect all of the apparent power delivered to the resistor to be directed towards real power and none towards a reactive interchange. Finally, a phasor diagram illustrates that source current leads supply voltage by 40.1 degrees. We should therefore expect total apparent power delivered to the complete circuit to be a mixture of real and reactive power, that real portion being dissipated by the resistor and that reactive portion being exchanged by the capacitor. Total apparent power delivered to the complete circuit is the complex conjugate of supply voltage times source current. Substituting our given values yields 112.4 millivolt amperes of apparent power. Resolving this into its real and reactive components yields a total real power figure of approximately 86 milliwatts and a total reactive power of approximately negative 72.4 millivars. Note that the negative sign indicates the reactive nature of this circuit is capacitive because source current is leading supply voltage. All real power will be dissipated by the resistor and all reactive power will be exchanged by the capacitor. Apparent power calculations for the individual elements support this conclusion. Apparent power delivered to the capacitor is 72.4 millivolt amperes of which 0 watts is directed towards real power and negative 72.4 millivars is directed towards a reactive interchange. Similarly, apparent power delivered to the resistor is 86 millivolt amperes, of which 86 milliwatts is directed towards real power, and zero vars is directed towards a reactive interchange. Now that we've got a theoretical basis of comparison, let's confirm these calculations using the oscilloscope. First, 
Let's slightly modify our circuit by incorporating a small 1 ohm sensing resistor in series with our circuit. We'll use this small sensing resistor to indirectly measure current through the circuit. Will an additional 1 ohm of resistance change our theoretical calculations? Yes, yes it will. However, the magnitude of the difference will be so small, this difference will be of little concern. Note that the function generator's lead at node D is ground referenced. This will be of critical importance when we measure voltage across individual elements using the oscilloscope. Channel 1 is placed node A to node D, where D is the grounded reference terminal. Channel 1 will measure source voltage. Similarly, channel 2 is placed node C to node D, where D is the grounded reference terminal. Channel 2 directly measures voltage across the 1 ohm sensing resistor. However, we can also set up and scale the oscilloscope to indirectly measure current given a 1 amp per volt scaling factor using techniques we learned in the measuring current using an oscilloscope lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. When these properties are simultaneously displayed and measured, we obtain the following data. Looks like source voltage has an RMS value of roughly 6.26 volts and a frequency of roughly 69.9 hertz, extremely close to our desired values of 6.3 volts and 70 hertz. This being said, current seems a little high. We anticipated roughly 18 milliampers and a phase shift of roughly 40 degrees. We're in fact observing 19 milliampers and a phase shift of approximately 37 degrees. These values are a little off, however, super close to our anticipated values. Given the slightly higher current, we might observe slightly higher apparent power figures. However, they should still be relatively close to our theoretical calculations. Let's see if this is the case. Can you use an oscilloscope to measure power? No, no you can't. Oscopes measure voltage only. This being said, did we just not trick the oscope into indirectly measuring current via the use of a sensing resistor and an appropriate automatic scaling factor like 30 seconds ago? Yes, yes we did. This is to suggest that more cunning trickery awaits. Part of the upcoming trickery is your understanding of a very basic property of power. Instantaneous power is the product of instantaneous voltage times instantaneous current. Power is voltage times current. Modern oscilloscopes often have a full set of math functions including multiplication at your disposal. Press the pink math button. We're presented with the following options. Operation, sources, position, and scale. Inside the operation submenu, press X for multiplication. Closing out the menu, we are rewarded with not only simultaneous display of supply voltage in yellow and source current in blue, but also their product, instantaneous power in red. Note the oscilloscope has even gone to the trouble of rescaling the result of the math operation in appropriate units, notably volts times amps or volt amperes. Each division for the red math operation is intended to have a vertical scale of 100 millivolt amperes per division. Can you dig it? Instantaneous power is the product of instantaneous voltage times instantaneous current. When the circuit experiences positive voltage and positive current, the circuit experiences positive power. And when the circuit experiences negative voltage and positive current, the circuit experiences negative power. When the circuit experiences negative voltage and negative current, the circuit experiences positive power. Finally, when the circuit experiences positive voltage and negative current, the circuit experiences negative power. For a single cycle of voltage and current, power experiences two bursts. Despite the time variant nature of instantaneous power, note power appears to be primarily on the positive side of the vertical axis, implying that this circuit is dissipating, on average, a positive amount of real power. If you squint your eyes just right, the center of the instantaneous power waveform might be right about here. This would be the average real power figure dissipated by the resistor inside this circuit. One can manually measure this property using a vertical scaling of 100 millivolt amperes per division or just as easily one of the numerous automated measurements. Choosing the mean or average value of the math function, we observe an average power figure of approximately 96.8 millivolt amperes. This is a little higher than our anticipated value of 86 milliwatts. However, within the range of expectations, given that we observed our current to be slightly higher than anticipated. Additionally, there might be some non-ideal elements in the circuit dissipating a small amount of real power that our theoretical calculations have not taken into account. Hint, hint. Let's now examine instantaneous power delivered to the individual elements. Since it's the easiest, let's first examine instantaneous power delivered to the resistor. Keep channel 2 where it is, so it indirectly measures current through this system. 
and then move channel 1 to measure voltage across the resistor, node B to D. When these properties voltage and current are simultaneously displayed and measured, we obtain the following data. Looks like voltage across the resistor has an RMS value of roughly 4.8 volts and current seems to be perfectly in phase with it. This perfectly matches our theoretical expectations. The product of voltage and current, power in red, demonstrates that the resistor experiences two bursts of positive power for every single cycle of voltage and current. Power dissipated by the resistor at all times is positive. Despite the time variant nature, there seems to be an average amount of power being dissipated by the resistor. In this case, a line that runs horizontally right down the middle. This is the average power figure. The Oscope automated measurement places a mean at 84.8 millivolt amperes. This is extremely close to our anticipated value of 86 milliwatts. Let's now examine instantaneous power delivered to the capacitor. This will take some additional trickery. Note node D serves as our ground reference, courtesy of the grounded lead on the function generator. The fundamental problem being is that the capacitor is not directly hooked to the grounded reference node. This is problematic because both channels in the oscope necessitate the use of a grounded reference lead. To further complicate this issue, the oscope I'm using has only two channels and we need to use one of them to indirectly measure current through the sensing resistor, also hooked to node D. There's a couple solutions to this problem. Expensive solution one, get yourself an oscope with more than two channels. It's not going to happen. However, if you did have that type of money, you could put channel 3 on node A and voltage across the capacitor will be channel 3 minus channel 1. Here's easier, cheaper solution number two. Power the circuit down and just swap out the position of the capacitor and resistor and power it back up. Have you changed the total impedance of this series circuit? No, no you haven't. If you haven't changed total impedance, have you changed source current? No, no you haven't. If you haven't changed source current or current through any of these elements, have you changed voltage across individual elements? No, no you haven't. Everything is the same, only the voltage across individual elements is now assigned to different nodes. In this altered configuration, voltage across the capacitor is now assigned to between node B and node D. As previously, voltage across the element of interest, in this case the capacitor, can be displayed using channel 1 and current through it can be indirectly displayed on channel 2. Stupid solution number 3. Flip the source on its head and relocate the sensing resistor to the newly grounded A node. Depending on how you look at this, you could also say you're keeping the source as it was and flipping the circuit on its head. Either way, this necessitates more work because the sensing resistor needs to be relocated to a grounded reference node, but it is still functional. This configuration highlights one of the properties of AC. Does it really matter which node serves as a grounded reference for a circuit that regularly experiences cyclical oscillations of polarity? Not in the slightest. In this configuration, the grounded lead of the function generator grounds node A. Channel 1 can measure voltage across the capacitor, node C to A, and channel 2 can indirectly measure current through the capacitor, node B to A. There's even stupider solutions to this conundrum involving isolation transformers and purposely ungrounding the function generator, but I am not going there for a very important reason. That reason being these methods are stupid and I don't like them. Let's make use of the simpler method too by swapping the position of the capacitor and resistor. When voltage on channel 1 and current on channel 2 are simultaneously displayed and measured, we observe the following data. Looks like voltage across the capacitor has an RMS value of roughly 4.2 volts and current seems to be leading it by 91.4 degrees. This is super close to our theoretical expectations of 4.1 volts with a 90 degree lead. The product of voltage and current, power and red, demonstrates the capacitor experiences equal and opposite regular periods of positive and negative power. This is the reactive power exchange between the capacitor and the source. Periods of positive power coincide with the capacitor charging and consuming power. Periods of negative power coincide with the capacitor discharging and returning power. On average, purely reactive powers theoretically consume no real power. However, the oscope demonstrates that this is not really the case. Although the periods of positive and negative power might initially appear to be balanced, the average value is slightly positive at roughly 5 millivolt amperes or 5 milliwatts of real power. This is that neglected amount of real power our calculations using ideal components fail to take into account. Additionally, realize any calculations involving sensing resistors and multiplication of these somewhat questionable indirect results 
has to jump through a bunch of mathematical hoops with a loss of fidelity at each hoop. This being said, any error we observe is extremely small and I'm overjoyed that it does jump through these hoops to yield results closely matching our theoretical expectations. In summary, instantaneous power is the product of instantaneous voltage times instantaneous current. If you can directly measure voltage and indirectly measure current using a sensing resistor, the product of these two properties is instantaneous power. Modern oscopes with a set of basic math functions make this indirect method of power display and measurement possible. In conclusion, this short lecture examined the means of indirectly measuring and displaying power on an oscope using the math function. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.